Hi, what's up? I'm Channel Pup, the mascot for the level-headed fanboy, and trust me, you guys need a level-headed perspective more than ever right now. Because we are talking about a subject that makes people very not level-headed. <laughs> Yes, that's right, folks. Today we are here to talk about Zack Snyder, who recently went on the Joe Rogan podcast and has caused an outrage among DC fans. Another one. Even this long after he's finished working on the DC films, Zack Snyder has still managed to find a way to make DC fans outraged. And I mean, as well as that, anyone going on the Joe Rogan podcast is going to form some kind of outrage. But it is what it is. The reason I'm making this video is because there's just a lot of misinformation going around regarding this conversation in which Zack Snyder does address the criticism of his Batman breaking the no-kill rule. So we're going to be discussing that today, debunking a lot of misinformation and just having a general discussion about Ben Affleck's version of Batman. I'm going to be looking at this with a level head, looking at it from both perspectives, but I am absolutely not going to be indulging any lies or exaggerations. Now before we get stuck in, if you do enjoy DC, DC topics, Batman, Superman, the Snyder films, then you're in the right place, because I love talking about them, and if you want to hear more of it, be sure to to hit subscribe if you haven't already. And this video, as always, is brought to you thanks to the support of my patrons. If you want to find out more about how you can become a patron, what rewards you can get in return, the Patreon link is in the description below, as well as a Ko-Fi link for one-off support, which keeps the lights on here at the old home of pub. Thank you. So okay, let's get stuck in here. Zack Snyder has brought up the criticism levied towards Batman killing in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, and has generally defended his decision to have Batman kill people in that movie. Obviously, Zack Snyder did not write the screenplay for Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. That was a collaboration between Chris Terrio and David S. Goyer. However, he did greatly influence the direction that the story would take, what they would be doing with these characters. Now, for anything I say about this to really matter, I feel like you do need to know my stance on Zack Snyder's DC films, as well as his take on Batfleck, who Batman is to me, so I, I guess I'll get started on that. To me, part of what makes Batman so great is that he suffered a massive tragedy that could make him hungry for revenge, but instead he uses that as his motivation to protect the innocents of Gotham City. But because of his understanding of mortality at a very young age, life to him is very sacred. He'd rather see Gotham City reformed than have the criminal scum wiped out. And he does it by being one of the smartest people on the planet. He's the world's greatest detective. He's an incredible scientist, a master tactician and marksman, and all that while being a mortal being in a world where people have superpowers. He has the peak human physical ability, and he has an unbreakable mentality. That to me is what Batman is. Like, it's kind of the Batman, the animated series, Arkhamverse kind of Batman, where he is just this very unbreakable figure. He's someone who constantly confronts people that are trying to break him, but he is unbreakable. To me, Batman isn't an anti-hero, he is a hero. There's a lot of people that he should kill. The Joker, for one example, is someone that Batman really should kill. But he's so unwavering in his values that he's not going to do that. He's not going to compromise that. That, to me, is Batman. He is the guardian of Gotham City first and foremost. He is a friend to Gotham City. And when we check in with Batman in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, things are very, very different to that. Now, a lot of people would describe Snyder's Batman as the Batman who kills, he's a radicalized Batman, he's a brute, he's more akin to the Punisher, he's dangerous, but I feel like that's an oversimplification if that is what you are referring to Batfleck as, because Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice is just one chapter in Batfleck's story, where when we move over to Zack Snyder's Justice League, we've got a reformed, redeemed, enlightened Batman who's kind of created this found family for himself with the Justice League that he wants to protect, he wants to look after, he wants to nurture. And where in Batman v Superman he wanted to kill Superman, in this one he's kind of a sentinel of life. He wants to bring Superman back. Batfleck's arc, his story, is one that can be summarized in a single shot from Zack Snyder's Justice League, where Superman pulls him out of the cooling tower. 
He's being lifted into the light by Superman. So no, I wouldn't describe Snyder's Batman as this extremist brute who kills people. I would describe him as a Batman that has been to a very, very dark place and managed to get back up from that. Despite the Batman being broken and radicalized in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, the true Batman ultimately prevails and it is thanks to Superman. The problem is though, there's having Batman in a very dark place, and then there is having Batman cross a line he swore never to cross. And while according to the story of Batflick, going from Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice all the way to Zack Snyder's Justice League, while according to that story, there is a coming back from that, in reality, he can't give back the lives that he took. And we're not just talking about people like the Joker, people who legitimately deserve to die. We are talking about hired goons. People that were just transporting cargo when they were moving the kryptonite around. People who probably shouldn't die because we don't know anything about them. They could have families, for what it's worth. So for my overall judgment when it comes to Batflex arc, I think this whole thing would have worked a lot better. And I, I don't know if Boba Talks has said this in his video, uh, but it is something that we've talked about quite extensively and we both agreed on. Batflex arc would have worked a lot better had we not seen him killing goons. So let's say he's still in that dark place that he is in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, where he's ready to kill Superman and you could have him, you know, rationalize it because Superman isn't really a human. He's an alien, he's a god, he's a deity, you know, it it's the humanity that makes life sacred to Batman. Have it so that his dark place is him plotting to kill Superman, but we don't see him gunning down goons and blowing people up. That way, the moment where he's about to kill Superman is just that bit more impactful, and it means that we haven't kind of crossed that line. We can look at Batfleck in Snyder's Justice League and still see the man that didn't break his no-kill rule. I genuinely think that that would be a better way to approach this story. However, I personally would chalk this up to a creative disagreement rather than I would fundamentally misunderstanding Batman or outright getting it wrong. Because the story that Zack Snyder was telling about Batman in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice through to Zack Snyder's Justice League was a story that does ultimately service the unbreakable nature of Batman. The fact that even after he's killed, he could still come back from that and be that virtuous Batman once again. Most depictions of Batman typically explore the idea that if Batman killed, there'd be kind of no going back. He's something different now, he's no longer Batman in that regard. Where Snyder's story for Batman is one that kind of says, no, he, he can come back. Batman can ultimately prevail even after killing. And that is quite a hopeful perspective on Batman, I'll say that much. But if you ask me, I personally disagree with the decision to actually have had Batman cross that line when it came to the mooks in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. I think because the story was ultimately in service of the Batman that we know and love, I'm okay with it. I don't think it misses the point. I would just prefer if we didn't cross that line. I think that's a little too far, personally. So my overall stance on Batfleck, my overall stance on Snyder's DC films is I think they're great films and I think Batfleck is a really cool version of this character. And I think where we ended up with Batfleck is a lot more in line with what I want from Batman than a lot of the live action Batman interpretations that came before him. We saw him doing a bit more detective stuff with him chasing down the white Portuguese in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, which made me really happy. We, we saw how resourceful he can be, that he is someone that can tackle a god effectively. That That's a side of Batman that we haven't really seen much of in live action before Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, and we finally got in that film. It's just unfortunately it came at the expense of the no kill rule. If we didn't have Batman crossing that line in that film, I, I would safely call Batfleck a perfect incarnation of Batman. Dare I say ideal. And the thing is, it also opens up more kind of worms, but at the same time, more potential for storytelling. I've heard the perspective of, if that's the case, why didn't Batman kill Joker? Why doesn't Batman kill a lot of his rogues gallery and stuff? And I, I think on one hand, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. On the other hand, that could have opened up stories about Batman's kind of relationship with these villains. Batman is someone who, in a lot of ways, sometimes is depicted as being quite dependent on enemies like the Joker. 
having kind of a dark, twisted, sort of sentimental attachment to him. He hates him, he wants nothing more than to kill him, but at the same time, he's kind of got a dependency on him. Can you tell that a lot of my kind of ideas for what I think Batman should be are kind of influenced by the Arkham games? So yeah, I love these movies. As a granular detail, I think Batman did get done a little dirty in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, and I also think it was in service of Superman. They wanted to put Batman in his darkest place so Superman could be the one to kind of inspire him out of that. And I think you could have only gone as dark as Batman is about to kill Superman, but I think what Snyder's mentality was maybe was, uh, let, let's put him even lower than that. Let's take him even lower. Let's say he's actually gone through with it. What bugs me is no one ever actually talks to Zack Snyder about Batman killing these goons. They only ever talk about it as a theme of the movie, and, and as far as the, the movie's theming is concerned, it's mainly talking about Batman wanting to kill Superman. I want to hear him talk about whether or not it was maybe too far to have had him kill the KG Beast goons. So moving over to what Zack Snyder said on the Joe Rogan podcast. And like, it, it seems like whenever Zack Snyder is in the topic of conversation, reading and listening comprehension goes out the fucking window. It's why there are people that legitimately believe that Batman and Superman stopped fighting because their mothers had the same name. And if you ever think that people don't deliberately misconstrue Zack Snyder from time to time, this video will give you definitive proof that people do do that. And anyone trying to argue with me after that is just gaslighting. So okay, I'm gonna play you the clip of what Zack Snyder has actually said about Batman's no-kill policy. I've read those two comics, it's hard to go back, mm. you know? To yeah. like, it, you you want to, and it's because I care that I want to take them apart. Like I want Batman. Like people are always like, well, Batman. I, Batman can't kill, right? So Batman can't kill is canon. And I'm like, okay, well, the first thing I want to do when you say that <laughs> <laughs> is I want to see what happens. And they go like, well, don't put him in a situation where he has to kill someone. I'm like, mm. well, that's just like. You're protecting your God in a weird way, right. right? You're making your God irrelevant if he can't be in that situation. He has to now deal with that. Yeah. You know, if he does do that, what does that mean? What is it? What is it? What does it tell you? But does he stand up to it? Can he survive that? Right? As a as a God, as your God, can Batman survive that? I never thought that that was canon that Batman can't kill. But well, for a lot of people, it is. That seems ridiculous given the circumstances in which he operates. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> So okay, starting off, he makes a point of saying that he's going at this from a very deconstructivist kind of mentality. He, as a storyteller, wants to deconstruct Batman. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's because I care that I want to take him apart. Like Deconstructing characters has been kind of a cornerstone of fictional storytelling, particularly in the comic book genre anyways. So yeah, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. And he kind of says, okay, so the understanding is, you know, Batman doesn't kill. The first thing he wants to do in his deconstructive take on it is kind of explore that. He doesn't explicitly say anything here. He just kind of chuckles. Like people are always like, well, Batman, I, Batman can't kill, right? So Batman can't kill is canon. And I'm like, okay, well, the first thing I want to do when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing inherently wrong with this either. If that's all he said, there's nothing really wrong with that. A storyteller is naturally going to be curious about exploring the how and why behind a character's rule set. Asking what if, what if Batman was a killer? What would prompt him to do that? Can he still be Batman even after doing that? But then he follows up and says that, like, the fans would respond, don't put Batman in a situation where he has to kill someone. Implying that it doesn't so much matter what Batman would do in that situation, more so it matters what situation we're putting Batman in in the first place. And they go like, well, don't put him in a situation where he has to kill someone. I'm like, mm. well, that's just like... You're protecting your god in a weird way, right. right? At this point, it's no longer a rule of the character's own agency. It's a restriction imposed by either the audience or the writer. And to that, Zack Snyder says, you're protecting your god in a weird way. And I'd say it's pretty easy to figure out what he actually means by that. Like, some folks are saying, oh, he's comparing Batman to God, which is ridiculous. I've actually seen people saying that. No, it's that we as fans, Batman means a lot to us. So he's asking, like, why are you imposing these restrictions on what stories can be told with Batman? And this extends to Superman as well. Like, I've long kind of said, like, you know, Superman in the situation he's in in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, 
he wouldn't be a happy guy. Like, people have criticized he's not a very happy guy in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, and he doesn't kind of exude that hopeful sort of virtuosity of Superman. And I've kind of said, like, what, why would he act any differently in that film? Why would he be all smiles when the Senate building's been blown up? And people have said, well, don't tell that kind of story with Superman. Why not? Why not tell that story? Why should Superman just be confined to escapism when there's lots of other characters that we allow to tell more relevant kind of real world parallel stories to? You're protecting your god in a weird way, right? right? So while I don't agree that like Batman should be killing in this story, while I personally prefer a more unbreakable Batman that wouldn't get to that extent even in the face of all he's facing here, like I'd rather see him overcome that I definitely agree with the sentiment that if we constantly restrict what kind of stories can be told with these characters, they're going to become irrelevant because they're just going to be doing the same thing over and over again. They're going to become predictable. And that's exactly what Zack Snyder says. He says you are making your god irrelevant if he can never be in that situation. You're making your god irrelevant if he can't be in that situation. He doesn't say you're making your god irrelevant if he can't kill. He doesn't say you're making your god irrelevant if he never breaks his own rules. He says you're making your god irrelevant if he can't be in that situation. Explicitly, you are making your god irrelevant if he can never be in that situation. Could this have all been clarified and worded better? Yes. But as someone who also runs his own podcast on Fridays over on Sunset City, I can also attest that in a podcast environment where everything's live, you haven't scripted things, you haven't written things down, you're not always going to say the best version of your opinion, the most nuanced version. There have been times when I've kind of said something over on Sunset City and been like, I need to make a Channel Pup video about this to better actually articulate this. The podcast environment does mean that you are going to get less flattering versions of what you're saying, but to be honest, I've easily figured out what he actually means by this. And I would love to say that's because I'm clever, but the actuality is I'm just not stupid. I am not someone trying to validate their own biased agenda against Zack Snyder. He has to now deal with that. Yeah. You know, if he does do that, what does that mean? What is it? What is it? What does it tell you? But does he stand up to it? Can he survive that? Right? As a, as a god, as your god, can Batman survive that? And so Snyder follows up with, and yes, because Batman kind of crosses that line, what does that mean for Batman? Like, does he overcome this? And again, it's a good question. It's one worth asking. A and people have said that, like, okay, maybe it's worth asking, but do it in like an Elseworlds story. I honestly respect the kind of courage it takes to kind of do this with a centralized version of Batman. Do I agree with it? Not necessarily, but I respect it. And you know, I I've said myself, I, I would prefer for Batman's kind of ideology to overcome that initially and not even get to that stage where he is killing people. Like, you know, Jason Todd, or if it's Dick Grayson in this universe, gets killed by the Joker. He doesn't start killing people. He doesn't betray his principles because Batman is unbreakable. But just as Zack Snyder wanted a very deconstructivist, very humanized take on Superman, he's done the same with Batman. This is a guy that can falter. This is a guy that can fail. This is a guy that can be very mentally unwell at times. And while I disagree with decisions within that, I certainly respect the overall intention of the piece. It's why, while on a creative level, I fundamentally disagree with a major part of Batman's story in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, I still love the film. And I mean, even then, in a vacuum, let's just say for the sake of a hypothetical argument, like, let's say, you know, Batman didn't exist before this, this was just a film, like, I still think Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, on its own two feet, divorced from any adaptation, is a very good film. But okay, I tell you what, I would have more of a problem with it if it was kind of the Michael Keaton style of Batman, where he just kills. Killing is just part of what he does, it's never really acknowledged. I like the fact that Zack Snyder has taken a story where Batman kills, and made it in service of a Batman who doesn't kill. We've got the Martha scene. We've got, you know, what happens between him and Superman, which kind of restores that sense of humanity within him. And again, I also think that would have been a lot cleaner if we didn't see Batman then quite obviously killing goons in the scene after. I feel like this is more a question of how far is too far when it comes to deconstructing a character or adapting a character. Like, take Spider-Man, for example. That's another character that has quite a strict no-kill rule. If you had a story where Spider-Man is now killing folks, but it's okay because all in service of him kind of getting back on that right track of not killing folks, 
I, I would have a huge problem with that. I, you know, I, I don't think Spider-Man should necessarily kill in cold blood or anything like that. And I did initially take some issue with the fact that had, you know, Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man not been there in No Way Home, that Tom Holland's Spider-Man would have just killed the Green Goblin straight up. But the thing with Spider-Man is while he has a no-kill rule in place, it's not quite as explored as it is with Batman. It's not quite as explicit as it is with Batman. Batman talks about it a lot, and I think because of that, you can kind of include that in a deconstructivist narrative when it comes to Batman. But I mean, okay, for Pete's sake, Spider-Man stories have put him in positions where he kind of thinks he's killed, like for example, Spider-Man 3, when he thinks he's killed Sandman. Like he ultimately, to all intents and purposes, wanted to kill Sandman in that moment, thought he did. But it's justified because of where Spider-Man is at at the story. With Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, it is pretty much the same thing. I just think the problem is, after the fact, I think there's probably a lot of people that are going to look at the redeemed Batman that we see in Zack Snyder's Justice League and still just see a killer. I know that there are people that uh, look at Peter Parker after Spider-Man 3 and just see a woman beater because he slapped MJ in that one scene. I think that is where the real harm is done here. I think that is the question is how far is too far, which is where I think this all becomes a lot more subjective. At the same time, like I mentioned, you know, like Tim Burton's Batman just does kill. That's just something he does. Um, and you could ask me why I don't have a problem with it. My, my answer would be that these films, for starters, released in 1989. Superhero adaptations were in a different place at the time. And like the Tim Burton Batman takes very little from the source material in the grand scheme of things. Those are predominantly Tim Burton films. And I like them as Tim Burton films. Like Batman Returns as a Batman movie is barely existent. But as a Tim Burton film, I enjoy it a lot. And I think maybe the same does go for Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice as well. I enjoy that because that's a Zack Snyder movie more than I do as a DC film. I mean, I definitely enjoy it a lot as a Superman film. I, I think, you know, as far as Superman goes, like dead on, that is Superman. An idealist in a very not ideal world. As far as Batman goes, yeah, it's, it's breaking some rules, no doubt. I think what I'm rejecting, though, is the notion that Zack Snyder A, doesn't understand these characters, and B, doesn't respect these characters. What he's done is told very serious stories that mirror the real world with these characters that don't rely on jokes or anything like that. He takes these characters seriously and treats them with dignity. He treats them like they're actual people. That's what I like about Zack Snyder's DC Universe. There's an unflinching sincerity to it. We're not going to dodge certain stories just because it feels uncomfortable to fans of the character. We're gonna challenge it. And we've got a story where, in the end, Batman was in a very dark place, broke his rules and everything like that, but this was all restored, and he was shown that this isn't right by Superman's sacrifice. Superman, a man who died for a world that was rejecting him. So it all falls back in line with what we expect from these characters. So yeah, I absolutely reject the notion that Zack Snyder doesn't understand, like, or respect these characters. That's just absolute poppycock. What that is, is projection. And all Zack Snyder has said is restricting these characters to just be one thing that tell one specific type of story will make them irrelevant. He's absolutely right about that. We're seeing the effects of that on, say, 616 Spider-Man, where Marvel editorial are constantly imposing restrictions that Spider-Man can only be one thing. He must be someone with a failed love life. He must be someone who's always poor. He must be that teenage loser, regardless of how deep into his 20s he is. It's why the mainline Spider-Man comic books are irrelevant. And I've seen the argument of don't do this for the centralized universe, but, but then we complain about how the MCU is too safe. I feel like I'd kill to just get a movie like Batman v Superman in the MCU. Something as ambitious as that. Something that makes me think twice about these characters. Something that really challenges them. I find it funny how like in like the post 2020 world, the conversation skews more towards, I wish these movies wouldn't play it so safe. Yet we still talk about a film like Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice with the 2016 goggles on. As though it isn't more or less what we're asking for these days. But okay, to prove further that reading and listening comprehension just goes completely out of the window when it comes to Zack Snyder. Let's look at how the press have uh, sensationalized this as usual. I made a video a while back about like the truth about the Snyder cult, why they are so holier than thou, why they can be so narcissistic, so vitriolic, and I, I did state that it's a cycle that ultimately begins at people seemingly deliberately misconstruing anything Zack Snyder does, and then the press or the media will jump on board with it 
and then the Snyder Cult will get defensive, and then the media and the press will say the Snyder Cult are a bunch of losers, and so on and so forth. It is a cyclical thing. Like, hard edge Snyder anti-people, people that hate Zack Snyder with a burning passion, are just as bad as the Cult, because they enable the Cult, and vice versa. It's a cycle. And that is just how the world works, that's common sense. But okay, we've watched the soundbite, we've dissected the soundbite. So, here's IGN saying, Zack Snyder has said DC is making Batman irrelevant if he can't kill. Let's play the soundbite back again. And they go like, well, don't put him in a situation where he has to kill someone. I'm like, well, that's just like, you're protecting your God in a weird way, right? right? You're making your God irrelevant if he can't be in that situation. He has to now deal with that. So as you can tell, that's not what he said. And some folks who like Zack Snyder have tweeted out saying, that's not what this is said. This is a clickbait article. And people have come back and said, no, that's literally what he said. Okay, reading comprehension, listening comprehension. Okay, here we go. The quote is, that is literally what he said. So here is literally what he said. And they go like, well, don't put him in a situation where he has to kill someone. I'm like, well, that's just like, you're protecting your God in a weird way, right. right? You're making your God irrelevant if he can't be in that situation. He has to now deal with that. So find me the part where Zack Snyder literally says DC is making Batman irrelevant if he can't kill. Exactly. He doesn't fucking say it. You're gaslighting yourselves. You're just using this to back up your own bias. And if, if you think for a second there isn't a bias, I have seen people saying, and I quote, I finally have a reason to hate him. Let's just look at that. I finally have a reason to hate him. So you admit that you just hated him without really understanding why before. That proves that there is absolutely an agenda when it comes to Zack Snyder. This isn't me being defensive. This is me being rational. So Zack Snyder has not said you're making him irrelevant if you can't kill. He said you make a character irrelevant if you are restricting what situations a character can and can't be in. Which is 100% proven correct. I'm not saying you have to agree with Zack Snyder. And, you know, maybe you do believe that these restrictions should be put in place. Fair enough. But there's no saying that you are right about that. This is all so much more subjective than people on Twitter are making. I mean, it's Twitter, isn't it, at the end of the day? A place where just the most basic of comprehension goes to die. I feel like I myself am going on a character arc that's just gonna lead to me deleting my Twitter because it just every time I go on there, it's just stupidity. It's just noise, you know? I, I, I am saying you don't have to agree with Zack Snyder. You don't even have to like Zack Snyder, but what I just resent is just the sheer amount of lying and gaslighting and just moving of goalposts that goes on to just keep hating this guy, and it's just ridiculous. If you hate him, you hate him, and that's fine. But I don't think you can really argue with anything that I've said here. And there comes a point where you just have to admit that you're lying to yourself. So yeah, truth's out, folks. What do you guys think? Comment below, discuss, and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to support more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and in the description below is the link to my Patreon page, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get your name in the credits of these videos, as well as other rewards, such as behind-the-scenes access to some of my uh, fan films that I've got in the making. A special shout-out goes to the patrons in the $5 and above tier. Their names are Wilma, Kalex, Richard Rogers, Glad Goku, Dare Denny, SSS06, Kale Bennett, That Jordo, Ken K of Warheads, Dazzle Fizzle, SP can't come to the phone right now, please leave a message after the beep, beep, Cirrus the Skeptic, Biotin, I bought the entire helium supply, have fun blowing up balloons now, and Vera Wild. Thank you to you folks so much for your generosity, and to those of you at home, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day. Get out of here.